Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Fabian with a special message. Um, as you all know, coronavirus is in full effect and it is taking its toll on every single industry, ours included. Um, so we're going to try to keep this thing going as consistently as possible with minimal hiccups and we've got some hopefully fun stuff scheduled along the way but I just wanted to let you guys know that you can rely on us for content every single week uh, that will not stop on our end and we hope that you uh, guys enjoy the episodes that we will continue to put out and that you and your family are staying safe and healthy uh, throughout this whole process. But thank you guys for listening to the show and we hope you enjoy it. This is Trevor Belden. I'm a lawyer and entrepreneur and you're listening to the Drink Culture Podcast. I think for most of us though, what we're passionate about is like being good at something or being super productive at something or being looked upon by others as an expert at something. I think that drives sort of most of us and that gets us up in the morning and that makes us put in the hours and stuff like that. And I felt like legal work was that for me. Hey guys, it's Fabian and you are listening to another episode of the Drink Culture Podcast a show about the business owners, thought leaders, and creators who have helped make Indianapolis what it is today. We want you to drink deep of the culture that surrounds you, so listen in. This episode of the Drink Culture Podcast is made possible by support from our sponsors. We are supported by Full Stack. If you're trying to grow your business, you know HR is a challenge. Why make it harder by doing it all yourself? Instead of filling out employee paperwork, filing compliance forms, and worrying about following all those rules and regulations, let Full Stack PEO do it for you so you can put your time and effort into building your company. Find out more at fullstackpeo.com slash D-R-N-K-C-L-T-R. So anyway, yeah, it's what? Geez, what's today? Thursday. It's Thursday, March. Everybody, look at your Apple Watch if you have one. Twelve, March twelfth. Okay, so something huge, and we rarely ever start the show like this. Uh, and Trevor, I don't, I don't want to take away any of your time to talk sure. about this. But last night, um, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump made an address to the entire country to address coronavirus, right? Like you cannot avoid it. It's, it's happening. Uh, you've probably gone to the store, tried to buy hand sanitizer. It's out. There's no toilet paper. All the beans are gone. People are going crazy. Uh, but shit's getting real. Uh, he banned travel at beginning Friday at midnight from uh, Europe with the exception of the UK. Uh, that's going to wreak havoc, I'm sure, on, on the economy in some way. It's, it, it kind of already has. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're giving relief to medical insurance companies, small business loans to small business owners so that they can help their employees and themselves. So, I, I mean, we're, we're, it sounds like we're going into a crisis, right? And if you didn't feel that way before yesterday, you probably do today. I'm scared shitless. Yeah, I mean, has it affected your day-to-day yet? Yeah, for sure. So, I feel like this podcasting session is a microcosm of everything. Like, there's nothing that's not affected by the coronavirus right now. Um, And it's such an interesting day because I feel like it's a unique point in this whole thing where there are still so many questions. We don't know the impact. We don't know the effect. But it's gotten to the point where everybody truly believes it's very serious. And so now, you know, it's it's kind of sleepless nights for a lot of people uh, because it just... it's affecting everybody right now. So it's, it's a unique time. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty, 100% guilty of being that person for the last three weeks, maybe, since like we've really heard about this, four weeks, that I'm just like, oh, I'm healthy. I'm fine. No big deal. This is going to affect me. Like It's going to blow over. Six months from now, a year from now, we're going to look back on this like we did with... What Ebola. swine flu, H1N1 back in 2009 and mm-hmm. all, you know, um, uh, SARS and everything else that's kind of happened in the past and just look back on it and be like, okay, yeah, it was just a, a, a time period. But like, I've never felt the way I'm feeling right now 
and that could also be the evolution of my own life of you know being a business owner, being a relationship builder, being around people. Being a father. What's that? Being a father. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Having a you know ten month old daughter that it's just sure. like this is real now. Yeah, I, I you know I think instinctively I'm thinking about myself and my personal life and my businesses and my family, and there's a lot to get my head around with that but then if I allow myself to think about other people yep. and the situ- situations they're in it's almost too much it's almost too much to even comprehend uh, at this point so I feel like all we can do is be steadfast be gritty be smart and eventually of course we'll get on the other side of it uh, but man right now it's it's just scary yeah and maybe it's because I recently started taking CBD that I've been like chill about the whole thing uh, but like it, it started to impact things in my my day to day life I think I was just talking to you guys I was supposed to be on vacation next week that got postponed we were supposed to have a good friend come in town on, on Saturday and th- this Saturday and her boss was like if you leave the state like you have to self quarantine yourself from our office for two weeks before you can come back. She's like, I'm not trying to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and if you guys go listen, if you're interested in really like diving deep into what's going on, like a great resource that we were all just talking about, uh, Joe Rogan had on a guy, Michael something, I forget what his name is, but it's very recent episode. So by the time you're listening to this, it's been about a week and a half. And that, that guy just really dives into what, actually is going on what to be concerned about what not to be concerned about but he he doesn't really sugarcoat anything and he doesn't necessarily sensational sensationalize uh anything and it's i I think it's a great resource like i I really enjoy listening to that and what's crazy about it is like this won't be released for another week and so much is going to change by that point right right? like we're going to know so much more information we're going to you know we could be in a state here in Indiana and in Indianapolis specific where you know businesses are shut down any sort of like in every it's already happening with events but maybe our entire government says like just don't go to yeah. the public like yeah. we might have to sit in that for three to six months I think my biggest thing is trying to be you know being an opportunist and always thinking positively is like how can how can we spin this to bring people together and work together as you know as a city as a state as a country to help small businesses help those in need help other people that so it doesn't impact them as much yep. as as it could be if we kind of did a survival of the fittest essentially for sure yeah it's, it's definitely time to come together that's for sure a couple like so the things that make me optimistic I feel like uh, now we have so much better our, our access to information is so much better now than it ever has been before and so the word is getting out so much better information is getting out to all the people and then just from a scientific standpoint like I I read today that the Cleveland Clinic has in like it took them 48 hours to make the test for coronavirus uh, one that you can get a a result in like eight hours whereas before it was two to three days Mm -hmm. and so they think they knocked that out in 48 hours so I feel like it gives me optimism that the really smart people in the world who are focused on this will make a difference well and and poor tom hanks right america's beloved sweetheart tom yeah. hanks has yeah. come down that's not i'm not laughing uh has come down with coronavirus but you know if anything look at his tweet he's very hopeful uh, yeah. about what's going on yeah. so i mean keep, keep the faith um we shall but, yeah, see coronavirus man it's, it's real it's out there covid19 uh but Anyway, we're, we're at Babies. Um, it's my second time back here. It's had a great, great lunch with you when, when we were here. Shout out to the Buffalo Chicken Sandwich. Uh, <laughs> but, but Trevor, you owner, co-owner? Co-owner, yeah. Co- co-owner of Babies, co-owner at Ball and Biscuit. Yep. Uh, practicing lawyer. Yes, right. Uh, yep. As well. So entrepreneur, lawyer, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Long time listener, as you guys have known, and uh, longtime friends with you guys. So it's honor to be on here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, Jared. I, I just said I, I appreciate you. it. Like he's, he listens. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Um, yeah. So we we want to start kind of at the beginning. Uh, you guys are familiar with the format of our show. We kind of take things back to the start and try to weave our way back to kind of where we are today. So uh, talk a little bit about about where you grew up. Yeah. So I'm from Michigan originally, a town there called Allegan. Pretty small town, southwest part of the state. Um, my family's still there. Uh, <clears throat> so 
grew up there. Um, it's interesting in terms of my uh, path to Indianapolis. So the rational explanation is, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer. Indianapolis was a good legal community, and I had some friends here. That's and it's not too far from, you know, it's a three and a half hour drive from my family. So those, that's like the rational way of looking at it. But there's kind of an interesting thing. So when I was a real little kid, I was on vacation in Mackinac Island, Michigan, which is a real cool spot if you haven't been. And my parents were like, okay, to so my brother and I, you can pick out a souvenir. What do you want? And for whatever reason, and I think I know... Um, I chose a Purdue sweatshirt <laughs> up in Mackinac, and I think it's because I'm a basketball fan. I enjoy playing basketball, uh, and so I said that, and they said, cool, have that, and so long story short, I ended up actually going to Purdue. I took a visit, liked it, felt like that would be a good spot. Hold on. So do you honestly think that that Total sweatshirt... Total correlation. Total correlation. <laughs> Yes. And you had no, like, no family went there or anything? No. No friends from college. Uh, <laughs> it was enough to put it in my mind as a place to visit. And right. geographically, it was within a decent zone. So, And I just I, I enjoyed my visit, and it was different. And so I gave it a shot, enjoyed it. Um, uh, met, my, met some really good friends who then, you know, uh, after law school, I went back. So I went to Michigan for law school. Um, and after that, I thought, where am I going to go? Indianapolis has a like, great community, um, legal community, but well, my friends were here from college, and I remember uh, the firm then at the time had representatives uh, interviewing, and we were talking, and they said that they played basketball like in the mornings before going into the office, and I thought, man, that sounds amazing. So uh, it was part of the decision uh, to come here. So in a way, basketball has led me to uh, Indianapolis. And were either of your parents like uh, attorneys or anything like that? What did, what did they do? Nope. I, I was the first uh, in the family to go to college. So my, my father spent 45 years in the aggregate industry, meaning um, sand and gravel industry. We have quarries in Indiana. They have something similar in Michigan. So his whole life was in that. Um, and then my mom, she she was kind of entrepreneurial. She was a she was an assistant uh, various times. She opened up her own shop once, um, and so she she did a variety of things. But for some of that time, she was just sort of home with uh, my brother and I. And is it just you and one brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah two of us. And did he end up going to Purdue? So, he, nope, he's still in in Allegan, Michigan. He kind of went into the same industry that my father went into. Uh, and so he's there. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, when when you were at Purdue, did you have like mentors or anybody like that that were kind of leading you down down the law path? Uh, no, I think what I learned at Purdue was that uh, I really enjoyed um, communication. I really enjoyed business, and so. Those things sort of trended me towards law. Um, and so it was enough that I thought I'd, get, I'd give it a shot. I'd do the LSAT and like that. And so I kind of tested the waters. And I was just kind of getting mo more and more momentum. I actually uh, worked for a law firm in West Lafayette for a period of time just to get a sense for it and thought that that would be, I thought I was, you know, could enjoy it long term. What, what were you doing when you were there? Oh, man answering the phone, sitting at the front desk, filing, errand And none of boy. that scared you? Like scared you no, away from it? No, not really. I mean, I, I didn't I, you know, realize that that wasn't the type of law, sort of family law type stuff that I, that I ultimately wanted to practice. But uh, I, I like the professional environment. Um, yeah, it's one of those things. So I'm a big believer that, you know, there, there are rare folks who have a topic that they're just passionate about and they can turn that into a career and so like art and sports come to mind like I'm just passionate about hoops I want to be a basketball player and I can be and make, make a living I think for most of us though what we're passionate about is like being good at something or being super productive at something or being 
looked upon by others as an expert at something. I think that drives sort of most of us, and that gets us up in the morning, and that makes us put in the hours and stuff like that. And I felt like legal work was that for me. Like nobody, I'm not, I'm, so I'm a corporate lawyer, but I use the tax lawyer example. So like nobody says I'm passionate about tax. No, like no, nobody, that doesn't exist for anybody. <laughs> But tax lawyers can be very passionate about what they do because they're super smart at it, they're experts, they're called upon, they're critical to their clients. So I, that's, that's my way of sort of looking at it. That's how I think I've, uh, I've become sort of uh, so engaged in practicing law. So in your specific focus, and it's mergers and acquisitions, correct? Right. m and yep. yep. When was the first example or first time you kind of came across that type of law yeah and that like i guess was there a moment they were just like oh shit like i really like this work right right so um so the first time i got involved in a project that was sort of hands-on in corporate I, it wasn't an m a deal particularly but it was an investment deal so i was part of a program at school at, at the university of michigan for law school where they paired law school students with engineers and mba students and the idea was you guys put together a business plan and then you'll pitch to a group of venture capitalists at the end of the semester. And so the law students were just thrown in, right? We were the least valuable component of the team. And I got put on a really cool team. The main person, literally, I, no joke, before he got his MBA, he was a, a rocket scientist. That was his... <laughs> like actual... Like, a, like for, for school, he was a rocket scientist? Yeah, out of school, he was a practicing <laughs> rocket scientist and then went back to school. So these folks were really cool. They had a great team. This was in 2000, uh, 99 and 2000, so dot-com type companies. So relatively easy to throw a business plan around a dot-com idea and, and pitch it. Uh, this particular business was called Hit Playlist. Uh, Fabian, you're big into music. So the idea was um, a platform for independent artists to upload their music. People could download it. It would sort of rank these things and then radio stations could access both the rankings and the digital music and play it like interspersed with popular music. Oh, that's pretty awesome. So yeah, it was, was kind of cool and you know, we, we pitched to the venture capitalists very very awesome experience i was so nervous um but it went well and so you know uh, actually a, a graduation ha happened a few folks stayed behind to try to really see if it would go didn't um but man it's amazing experience totally amazing experience and that was my first sort of personal involvement in a venture i, I think what, what do you think made you so nervous about that experience i don't know i mean just speaking in front of people i'm sure Definitely not wanting to let my team members down with my little, my, my little part of the pitch mm -hmm. that we had. Uh, but I learned that, like, anatomically or biologically, like, my, the blood goes right to the, my core. And, my, <laughs> and I'm, so I'm freezing. Like, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm so cold. And there's no reason to be. But I figured, like, that was the link. I was so nervous that <laughs> my body Your went body into, like, reacting. Pr protection mode. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense that every single time I get, like nervous in very specific situations like it's like i start shivering i start freezing i, I think and I'm just this like, is a thing yes. yeah yeah i'm sure there's we can do some uh, uh i think go google Googling. could, could kind of tell us <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um so i mean maybe just explain a little bit about mergers and acquisitions yeah, sure. i mean I've, I've definitely heard of it i think the most famous instance is in the movie american psycho anybody out there knows that movie see i thought it was uh on happy Gil or not billy madison or something isn't one of the titles like mergers and Acquis acquisitions well, he's he's at there's a scene it's very beginning of the movie he's there's at the scene there's an attractive bartender and she's like hey what do you do and uh he said i'm in murders and executions uh, and she's like wait what, what did you say yeah. Yeah, he said gotcha. mergers and acquisitions uh, yeah, like, oh, okay yeah. that's yeah. Good. great that's movie good. by the way yeah, yeah. yeah. classic um so just yeah so uh a little bit of background from the legal side of things. So, um, right out of law school in 2000, this is my 20th year, so I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary hey, in law. Yeah. Congratulations. And you're uh, only 25, right? I'm only 20. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's so Boy crazy. genius. Uh, so, I started with Baker and Daniels, um, and our firm is combined with other firms. So, today, the, the name is Fagri Drinker, and we have about 1,300 lawyers, uh, about 700 or so partners. I'm a, I'm a partner. Um, and day-to-day, -day, what I do is I help buyers or sellers 
completed transactions. So my client who is a company wants to buy another client or another company that wants to be sold. And there's a ton of legal work that goes into that from the due diligence where you are getting really into the target company and finding out about them and making sure that everything is is nice and clean or if it's not identifying that so like they're not telling you hey we make a million dollars a year and really they're making like two hundred and right yeah exactly or yeah. hey we we don't get into legal trouble but they've got all these lawsuits <laughs> you know something like that um, so there's the diligence and then there's the, the negotiation of the terms so we're gonna pay this price over this period of time with these representations and warranties and, and a ton of terms that go into it uh, and then the documentation. So the volume of paperwork <laughs> that goes into one of these is tremendous. And now it's mostly uh, digital, right? Yeah. So it's not so much in, in terms of bankers boxes full of files, but it's like a huge volume of paperwork that has to be created to memorialize what's happening with this big deal. Um, and then you have a closing and money changes hands and, and people are happy. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this type of law, transactional type of law versus other, you know, where people are in litigation, somebody is suing somebody, because at the end of a transaction, typically both sides are pretty happy about it, you know. Shake hands yeah, and shake hands, exchange and money. Yeah. And, um, so it's a good outcome for folks, whereas in litigation in a lawsuit, man, it's ad- so adversarial rarely is there a true winner or loser nobody's really very is that, <laughs> is, is that like a that type of per, like personality oh, style sure. that goes towards that type oh, of yeah, law yeah, you yeah. think yeah, yeah there has to be yeah there, I mean thank goodness you know more than half of our firm are, are those type of folks who battle it out on behalf of clients they're trying to get compensated and made whole for something that happened to them and uh they dig it. They, it's it's, do, it's more competitive, you know. It's uh, you know, so it, it fits their personality. It's just not my, you know, it's just not my. You thing. say competitive. Do those guys and gals like keep score? Essentially, like when they go in, is it like not not that it's a game? Like they're yeah. they're playing with people's lives here, uh, type of thing. But like, I mean, personally for the ego, right? Do, oh yeah. Do every, they do, I mean, there's a win or a loss at every turn, yeah. you know. So you make this filing and. How does the judge rule? Are you a winner on that one or, or not? Yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of that on the litigation side. Yeah. Can you talk about um, maybe like a high level deal that you've done in the past twenty years or something that that you're proud of um, from an M and A perspective? Yeah, for sure. So um, you know, or something listeners might be like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So in 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 this market, um, deals deal size totally ranges. It runs the gamut. So typically, my deals will be sort of $10 million to call it $500 million. Um, and usually throughout the year, there's a, there's a, there are a handful that are over $100 million bucks. And, and you know, it's interesting. Just because of the dollar amounts, it makes those, you know, interesting, you know, because it, it's, it's a big, big figure. And uh, typically, those are larger from a perspective of more employees are involved, more locations are involved, and a lot, of, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and typically, you're dealing with other professionals who are sort of at an elite level, and so it's really cool to work on sort of those types of transactions. Um, but in 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 this market, again, you're dealing with privately owned companies as well, and so I'll represent a seller, maybe like a third generation owner who's finally it's a good time to sell the business this is the one time event for them you know um and so that's a whole different like engagement like because it's you're really educating them about the process you're walking them through it uh and what i learned very early on it it's emotional it's it's so uh mentally like even though they could be 100 percent convinced this is the right move for them at the end of the day, this is like their company. Yeah. And yeah. This rationality is their goes out the window, I can yes. imagine. I mean, if my daughter's daughter sold Naptown 90 years from now, I don't know how I'd feel right. about it. <laughs> right. you know? Jared's claiming that he'll be 125 yeah, years yeah, old. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I like I'm dead. It. I like it. No, I I'm like dead, it. All right. No, but it's a weird anyway, place. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. But. So there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a consulting, like, being a psychiatrist component to those type of deals that are, you know, that's 
totally interesting. It's there's a human element to all of them, but especially on those, it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so we we kind of skipped ahead a little bit. So you, you went to. To, to Michigan to, to get your degree mm -hmm. in, in law. Did you ever feel like you were failing at, at that point in time? Did you Were you ever nervous about any of that? Um, nervous, sure. Um, I have this mindset, I think, of like I'm pretty good at figuring out exactly what I need to do but not anymore <laughs> <laughs> than to get things done. So I'll yeah. give you an example. This is a Purdue example. So back in the day, and I graduated at Purdue in 96, back in the day, they didn't, they had a, a letter grades A, B, C, D. They didn't have an A minus. They didn't have a B plus, right? So the key, if you really wanted to have a good grade point average, was to get a 90 or above. And for me, that meant get a 90, right? So I, that was my expertise, was getting a 90. And on the bar exam, they don't give you credit for like 100% of the bar exam. You've just got to get that one point above whatever. And so, you know, that was my, that was my goal. So I don't know. I, I, I try to utilize my time in that way and just focus on, you know, meeting the, meeting the goals that way. In law school, it's, it's tougher. In law school, you're graded by one exam typically. So no participation credits, no little tests or papers along the way. It's the final exam. And that's your grade. That makes me nervous. <laughs> like that makes me sweat to think about yeah. that. And it's like they, they probably don't care if you show up to class or not. You paid money to be there. You're an adult. Like sometimes is it gonna go or not? Yeah, sometimes the professor will like have an annoyed look, but at the end of the day you, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a colleague of mine, um, shout out to Jim Burge, was uh, also at Michigan a year ahead of me and he was sort of famous for not really going, just going to ace the exams. <laughs> what it, what it came How do you to do it. that? Some people have that talent. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd be nervous, just cram, yeah. cram, cram yeah. everything in for the night before or something like that. I would get annoyed. So there was also a, a, a girl in my class who, in the uh, her last name in the alphabet was next to mine, and she never showed up. And so it would be so annoying. The professor would call her name. And had she been there, she would answer, and I would have time to like get prepared and stuff. But she's never there, and so automatically he would go to my name, and so I would get like surprised with surprise questions and stuff oh, like no. that. Yeah, the Socratic method in, in law school. Yeah. Oh, so they would like ask you questions like right at the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. right in front of everybody. Yeah. So like, what what is an example of that? I, I, I couldn't even like what is fathom. even the Socratic method so the Socratic method is a, a way that professors in law school teach through you know posing questions to the students mostly sort of open ended they'll take you down in different directions uh, to try to draw from you the, 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 the right answer but you've got to sort of work it out publicly in front of everybody else. So they like poke and prod until like... Yeah, sure. Oh, man. Except, sometimes make fun, you know. Yeah, so... <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I've heard Caitlin talk about this before, yeah. but it's not really like a raise your hand and answer question type environment. It's more of like the professor's... If you're the type of person that kind of like leans down in their yeah. chair and hides a little bit, like you're going to get called on more. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm sure this isn't unique to law school, but those were gunners. I'm, I'm sure everybody <laughs> had gunners in their classes that would just raise their hand for everything. But that was not me. Not not me either. <laughs> I bet I bet Kayla was a gunner. Uh, I, I can see that. Maybe I can see that. Um, what What was your first job when, when you graduated, or did you take like a gap year or anything? Did you travel? No. So I actually graduated um, in. Uh, a semester early from Purdue and so I stayed and worked at that law firm so that was my first job really and then out of law school straight to Baker and Daniels so I did a summer internship at Baker and Daniels started in 2000 at Baker and Daniels and so I've been literally going to the same office for 20 years wow yeah, yeah. what yeah. was Indianapolis like 2000 you know so f for me coming from Allegan Michigan it was very impressive it was big it was much more than I was used to um, so everything is relative, right? You know, so for me, it was, it was a big old city, uh, frankly. Um, there wasn't much of a downtown scene. Broderpool was the scene um, for nightlife and that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, uh, downtown um, it still had the business environment. That's where a lot of the business took place, which is still there, but also has moved a little bit north now. Um, and certainly, obviously, just the overall development of the city is like inc 
inc- uh, incredible over that period of time to now. Yeah. Placing yourself in that era, where would you hang out if you had to hang out downtown? Then? Yeah. So, um, back then, there were a couple places on Mass Ave. Okay. Only one of which is still, so, so uh, Chatterbox is still open. Um, so I would do that. Um, the front page was a long standing. RIP. RIP. Yeah. It's Kruger's now, right? Uh, it's so. Eagle. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Right, Eagle. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. Eagle. Um, and then there was an awesome breakfast late, late night place that I'm going to space its name. I want to say it's like the alley or something like It's not the alley. I really wish I wasn't uh, misremembering this, but this is a great place. Um, and every once in a while, somebody will talk about revitalizing it and asking the owners for recipes and stuff. But it, it's been gone for, for quite a while. Huh. So those were like, you know, they say that the, the uh, pioneers, you know, get the arrows and the settlers get the land. So those are kind of the pioneer places down there, uh, downtown. And we'll get into this, but I want to foreshadow a little bit. But at that time... Mm-hmm. Did you have the feeling or did you know that you wanted to be there? Um, so I, I bounced around quite a bit in India. Like I, and when I say like I'm some ball and biscuits yeah, specifically. So, so for, a, for a place, uh, I would say that I first started thinking about a retail place on Ball and Biscuit uh, about 14 years ago. Okay. Yeah, about 14. So Ball and Biscuit turns 10 this summer. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so... Uh, it took me a long time from idea to opening, so you know, probably about 14 years ago, I started thinking about it. And gotcha. at that time, I really thought like downtown was amazing, and there was all this stuff happening. And I thought for culture and nightlife, Mass Ave was going to be the spot. I, I don't think that was prescient <laughs> by any means. Right. Um, and I loved the 300 block because it was close to the business uh, area, you know. So the that all just made sense. Um, so yeah, I was very bullish on that for for retail, eventually, and living there. So I lived I lived above Palm Biscuit for about eight years in, in the building there. So it's awesome. We we had Tom Batista on the show, yeah. and he described Mass Ave as Skid Row, <laughs> uh, or or maybe somebody like had written about it, and they had written about it and described it as Skid Row. When when you were there, do you have the feel like? Did it feel like that? I mean, no. and that's very hyperbolic, right? Like right. if people are familiar with Skid Row, it's in Los Angeles. It's literally blocks, like city wide long blocks of just homeless people and drug addicts living in tents yeah right um so i don't think that it was that bad but no i think that goes back further than 20 years i think it i, I don't know at what point it sort mm-hmm. of turned the corner and became more sort of uh hipster isn't the right word but arts more, cultural distri- yeah, district yeah more more on the upswing mm-hmm. way back then right so uh like anything the uh the the pacing of that changes so it was on the upswing but kind of slowly for a while and then just hit like a rocket booster and you know blew up so let's jump back to 2000 you move here you're living in Indianapolis hey guys it's Fabian sorry to interrupt this awesome episode of the drink culture podcast but just wanted to remind you of a few things to really help us grow uh, our show in 2020 if you go right now to the link in our bio in on Instagram, you can hit three buttons that will really help us out this year. One, rate and review us. If you haven't rated or reviewed this show, please go do that right now, and then you can come back to the episode. But uh, we really appreciate those, and, and those go a long way. Two, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, what are you waiting for? Go do it right now. We send those on Wednesdays and Fridays. They're short and sweet and full of awesome information. So if you're not signed up, please go do that now. And if you already are, encourage a friend to go do that as well. Uh, and last, if you really want to help us continue to grow and, and you want to show support for the Drink Culture Podcast, maybe you might consider uh, donating to our Patreon page. So go check us out on, on Patreon, poke around, see if that's something that you might be interested in, but that would really go a long way. So we'll let you get back into this episode, but just wanted to thank you, say hello, and remind you of those few things that can all be found in the bio on our Instagram page. Thanks. So let's jump back to 2000. You move here. You're living in Indianapolis. You're working as a lawyer. 
um, I know Indie Hub comes in there somewhere. I know uh, Ball and Biscuit comes in there somewhere. Yeah. What was what was next? You're sitting there as a lawyer, and you're just like, okay, like yeah, when did this, when did you get bored with yeah, just being this, a lawyer? I got right? this lawyer right. thing down, <laughs> right. and now I'm just gonna go off and do a bunch of different other things for the community. Right. Well, I, I've, I so I thought about this in advance, and it's really interesting how serendipitous life can be and how things are connected. So I'll, I'll give you the, the skeleton version. So uh, Baker and Daniels gave me a lot of opportunities to, to network. Um, there was an organization at the time called Young Professionals of Central Indiana, YPCI. And um, so I, you know, but part, I, like I said, there's serendipity, but part of it is just showing up. You know, sometimes... It, not what you look forward to doing is just getting your, getting out there. But so I just showed up. I met some nice nice folks there. <clears throat> ended up like being on the board there. Uh, that uh, put me in sort of contact or connected me with a person whose name is Ann Shane, who is sort of a stalwart in the community. She's a community leader, and at that time Ann was with Bio Crossroads, and she was collecting ideas for attracting and retaining talent in Indy and so I got involved with that long story short that led to helping found Indy Hub Uh, Indy Hub which is uh, an organization whose mission is to get 20 and 30 somethings involved in the city Um, Indy Hub took off and it was doing really great under Molly Chavers and I was brainstorming about like really crazy and entrepreneurial ways of even doing something different with Indie Hub, and I thought, would it be cool to have a home base for Indie Hub, some place that people could go of that demographic could go and hang out? And I was thinking maybe this place would serve like coffee in the morning and beer and wine in the evening. And so I sort of just took it as my project to explore this. And I hired a consultant who helped people start restaurants and put together this business plan. And that concept was a sketchy concept. And so I, as I de risked it, it ended up being more of a nightlife place and less of a good fit for Indie Hub, this nonprofit. I mean, it was a looking back, it was would have been really risky because Indie Hub had a good brand and a good thing going. If this person who's never opened a bar before just like tanks, and then it would just you know potentially put the Indie Hub brand at risk. So I didn't want to do that. So, uh, but I put this energy into it and. I, I was enjoying it. The entrepreneurial part was fun. And so I just said I was going to do it. And so that's Ball and Biscuit. So actually our liquor license for Ball and Biscuit originally was The Hub. That was going to be the, the name of this thing for Indie Hub. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and it worked out great for everybody. Like Indie Hub is killing it. And Ball and Biscuit's done done well on its own. And so anyway, so Ball and Biscuit happened. Um, work with great people there. My operating partner, Kendall Lockwood, there. And, you know, after 10 years or so, like, it, we, we thought we could, you know, build upon that and do another one if the right opportunity came up. And she was certainly ready to have more responsibility and do something else. And so that's sort of where babies came in. Um, there's a lot there yeah. that, that we need to unpack. <laughs> I and told I, you I, I just do the skeleton. Well, and like, I commend you for like being able to concisely like put that story together. I, I'd still be on like detail number you two. Thought about I did that. think about it. I totally did. Um, uh, so, you know, let's let's everybody take a pause and like take a look at like some of the things that you're talking about. Indie Hub, very community focused, wanting to get people involved. Um, opening Ball and Biscuit on Mass Ave. That's a community within itself, right? It's a cultural district. I think it's got its own thing going on. And then you end up opening up Babies in Heron Morton District here, which also has this neighborhood community vibe that has its own thing going on here as well. So when when did that sense of community become important to you to like get involved and, and get active and want to like uplift younger generations or younger people that were also interested in some of these types of things? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think that I don't know that I can trace it to any particular thing. So my my parents, for sure, were uh, community involved, but in Allegan, that trains that, that translates to neighborly, right? They were super neighborly because that's what it, it looks like in a very small town, and so I definitely have that like ingrained in me from from them. Um, and here, getting involved in the community seemed to like cross off so many things like it's helping people it's 
a chance to meet people for me and develop relationships. But for you, what was like the first thing that you went out to? Like, what was the thing that motivated you to go out and say, I want to go participate in something? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I think we all understand. Yeah. Uh, like what would motivate like people yeah, to like, do so that like, in general, but like to right. dive deeper on that, like yeah. Ian Shane was looking for a project or looking for like, connecting these people. And you pretty much stepped up to the plate and said, well, this is, here's an idea. I yeah. mean, I think you were pretty modest in your skeleton version of things. Like you essentially helped found Indie Hub. Right. Sure. Yep. And like, like where, where did that idea come from? Yeah. I, I think it's similar to what we were talking about in terms of, you know, if you have an idea and you think it can be productive and put to good use, I don't know. You just feel like, let's go do it and let's make it happen. You know? Um, so like, I didn't really, I don't really have a passion for helping life sciences companies recruit people. Right. But I do have a passion for creating something that is beneficial and people rely upon and like that so that makes me feel good the creation part of it and the building part of it and the results make me feel good um so i think that's yeah. sort of at the heart of it really. can we can we dive in for two minutes and talk like how did you build that so was it like yeah. did you write a proposal send that in like how did molly chavers get hired like you know right. that whole process who, is, who is, approved it right like, exactly yeah. like that's a thing that people listening here are probably like oh i wanted to start something but like yeah par- paralysis by analysis because they don't right i said that right hey i said that right i usually get that wrong <laughs> anyways go for it yeah well first thing i'll say is you it would be extremely difficult to do such a thing in any other place, I'm convinced, than Indianapolis. Like, Indianapolis uh, is set up and it's more conducive to going out and doing these things than any other place I'm aware of. Um, and I don't know necessarily what the secret sauce is there, if it's the size, but I think it's the people. The people are so encouraging and, like, want to facilitate and want to help. So Ann Shane convened a group of folks from, like, every corner of the city to look at this issue. And I just happened to be there and sort of representative of the young professional crowd. And it was one of those things where like, I raised my hand and I said, what about this idea? And she, and she like basically said, great idea, go do that. You know? <laughs> and so, and the idea at the time was just, hey, let's just take an inventory of the young professional focused stuff that the city has going on. Because we don't, whatever we do, we don't want to duplicate what's already there and so she said can you do that and I said sure and so you know you show up and you do it uh, eventually that led to a business plan or white paper I should say and a business plan and with the help of Ann and other people who all re- were already established like they brought the resources they brought initial funding they brought people to add to the mix they brought Molly like hey we know this person we think would be a great fit for an executive director would you, you know meet with her what do you think and, so, and of course Molly was awesome and so shortly after we sort of got going Molly was hired and Molly is totally the George Washington of, of Indy Hub uh, and she was there for I think 13 years I guess which is a long time um, but she's like the, the, the founding CEO and, and really should get all the credit for kind of what it's done uh, the new CEO is awesome too um, Blake Johnson he's, he's, okay. he's okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding uh, he's, he's you know we, lo- we super lucked out with him he's for sure the Abraham Lincoln to her <laughs> to her George Washington I like, so. that. I like the analogies yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean was it successful it, from, t- from the beginning I, I think so yeah I mean we, we it started small like super small and I'll, I'll never forget, so our mission was to really promote the other stuff happening in the city for young professionals, because there was actually a lot going on, but maybe you just didn't know about all of it. So we were out there pushing events that YPCI was throwing and, and others, um, Agave at the uh, Idle George Museum, that's a young professional group. Um, and then one day, I like, there's an article in the star about Indie Hub. I'm like, oh, cool. And I'm reading it. And, and Molly sort of announced that the in, first Indie Hub event was in like three weeks or whatever. And so I called Molly. I'm like, oh, we're, we're hosting events? <laughs> and she said, I was kind of put on the spot by the reporter. So I said, we were hosting an event. And so that, that you know, you know, took us in another direction, changed the trajectory. We evolved with that. And so now we host a bunch of our own stuff uh, at, at Indie Hub. Um, so yeah, so little by little, and you know, we have we've gotten better at data and measuring success with actual numbers. 
uh, but we've always measured audience and how many people we reach through the newsletter, or the, the e-newsletter, mm-hmm. and social media and stuff. And it's it's grown tremendously. So yeah, very happy with it. What what, what about advice for for people? I know Jared just talked about like people listening wanting to do that. I know I've had like clandestine conversations about like oh we need to start this organization like without yeah. anybody else knowing and yeah. it's going to do this this and this but yeah. like what advice could you give to people that that really are seriously considering that sure i mean it can be done and the first step though i think is critical is know what's out there so yeah. do your research make sure that this is you're carving a niche for yourself because um because the support that you get will be different if if there's another one already doing this. So make sure that it's truly unique uh, because otherwise, if you're passionate about the particular thing, go help them. Like, I'm sure they need help. I'm sure they'll put you in a place where there's responsibility. Um, but if truly, if it's if it's open territory, then start it and just network and ask around. And I'm convinced here that you can find people who will, like, make meaningful contributions and help you get to whatever your goal is. I mean, there's so many countless examples of that from pattern to indie hub to, you know, these things that start small in the community. I mean, to think that like an organization like pattern is fashion focused could have multiple mayors like attending and supporting and promoting them. It's just amazing to me. And it's like so indie unique, I feel like. So yeah, I'd say go for it. What's your day-to-day with uh, Indie Hub? How, how involved are you still today? So Indie Hub now has two, two things. It has Indie Hub proper and then the foundation, which sort of helps provide financial support. And so I'm an emeritus board member of Indie Hub proper, uh, and I'm the chair of the foundation. So I'm, I'm still, you know, fairly involved uh, with everything. I, I'm... So I didn't mention I'm, uh, I'm married with a five-year-old or a three-year-old. So that means I'm not going to the nightlife indie hub stuff anymore, uh, or at least rarely. Uh, but I try to stay involved where I can. Very cool. Yeah. How do you balance all of that? <laughs> so it is a lot. Um, and I'm for sure blessed with a profession where a lot of times you can manage your schedule. So as long as things get done, as long as hours, you're putting in your hours, you're putting in your effort, when you do it can can vary and so uh you know i'm I'm able to do these things i I think that we all you guys know better than anybody have capacity to just keep adding a lot of times and just when you think you hit the limit then you add more and you get more efficient with how you do it by by uh necessity and you recognize the stuff that you can remove for sure i'm going through that right now absolutely you take out stuff that you thought was like key but Nah, it's not yeah. that, all that important. So you do some of that, but I will say, without a doubt, as I think about like Indie Hub and Ball and Biscuit and babies, especially, like I, it's I, it's not me. It's it's this whole team of folks, and so I'm not an operator. I don't do any operations for Ball and Biscuit or babies. That's all Kendall, and she kills it. And so, yes, I'm involved at a certain level, but it's at a level that I can afford with sort of all the stuff that I have going on. And the same with Indie Hub. I mean, forever Molly ran it, and now Blake runs it. And so I'm involved at a level, but at a level that where I still hope I'm adding value, but not it's not the same time commitment. And yeah. completely self-serving question, but is that something that you like write up into an operator's agreement uh, of like, this is how much I'm willing and able to commit to this business? Yeah, so even though I'm a lawyer, I don't do agreements. <laughs> That's interesting funny. talk about that why uh, you know it's funny so I'm I'm the least likely to negotiate uh, f- f- when, if I buy a car I'm the least like that's, like, that's likely crazy to negotiate right? buy that, a house. that you're saying this but because <laughs> you negotiate for, for, for other people for, for my, and maybe that's why like I'm so <laughs> over it right uh, um, yeah no I so I and, and if you if you slide an agreement to me like you know, we, we've taken out loans at both Ball and Biscuit and Babies right to help finance our startup paperwork gets slid to me I, I glance at what I think are probably and then I sign at the bottom I'm, I'm, I'm the least likely person to, to really care when it comes to my things <laughs> probably because I know what I'm looking for but uh, in any event so no no formal agreements but for sure expectations are set like Kendall knows like she's really responsible for staff she's that's that's I can't get involved with that yeah she don't have the time so 
Um, so yeah, it, it, and it happens over time. I mean, Kendall and I have been working together now for eight years, and over time, we've developed a, a good uh, understanding and relationship that way. So, did you open Ball and Biscuit with with Kendall as the operating partner? No, nope, she's the second one. So she, I started with another one, and she succeeded him, and then it's been hers since. So I guess my question lies, and I've always actually been curious in this because I, I I see Kendall around. Yeah. She's everywhere yeah, provider Pro- like every morning provider. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> she um, must live very close yeah uh, i don't know uh, i'm just saying yeah <laughs> but did, so was she an employee originally of ball and biscuit and kind of worked her way into that role and yes. then you saw something in her and you're and you're just like wow you're good at your job you're good with people you're good in this industry you crush it i i want this to be a successful business so i need you as a partner and bring on bring her in through what, whatever means ownership yada yada like i'm sure you have agreements in that line but yeah, is that right, kind of sure. how it the relationship was built or? yeah pretty close so it, it actually was more of a triage situation where okay. she stepped up i mean there was a spot and, and a need um because of the departure of the the first sort of general manager and she just stepped in and in with 100% grit, with 100% determination, with her experience she had in the industry, t- taught herself what she didn't know, and just killed it. And so, like, it's one of those situations that I didn't have much choice, but either to. But it like, was so it was just happy, you know, luck yeah. that she's done so well. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's terrific, and it worked. It's worked out really well. And that's what I've always been curious about that because, like, I'm a firm believer in whatever I do, I'm gonna do 110, mm-hmm. percent right? And you know, I love when an employee takes the, you know, takes it upon themselves to just work as hard as they can possibly work to pretty much create a job for themselves. Like, mm-hmm. it's like, you know what? You have to give me this job. You have to give me a raise because I'm doing all this good for the company. Yeah. And I was, I've always been curious if that was kind of the situation with Kendall and like how she's developed within, you know, within your LLCs, essentially right. within your businesses. Yeah. I mean, babies is a good example. So, um, you know, about four years ago, it was clear that so Ball Biscuits a rel- relatively small operation, and she was getting really good. And you know, she, like, there are a lot of motivations for me to want to do a second spot. Um, but one real uh, motivation was to keep her engaged and to keep you know finding challenging you know opportunities for her because she's so good. I definitely would would never want to lose her or have her not be fulfilled. And so that was a big part of like trying to do another place very cool yeah uh for anybody that's been there uh you'll notice that and i haven't been there in a, in a few months but come on man <laughs> yeah i know sorry <laughs> where's your support i just got, I, I, got two cats man yeah exactly <laughs> i'm busy with the cats um but no how did her family get involved oh so kennel comes from a family of let's see and did you try siblings? did you try that one uh, no okay jared pour some of that one if so. you don't mind thank you uh, I'm going to get this wrong. She, I think she's either one of eight or has eight siblings. I forget. Um, and You know, it's just one less human one, being. One off. Yeah, yeah, just one no, off. No, yeah. you're close. I, I can, if I go down all their names, I could add them up. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a tremendous... Like, there should be a reality show for this family because they're so awesome. They're, like, terrific people, but also have their own personalities... They're all characters, and fortunately, 90% of them have worked at <laughs> Paul and Biscuit and or Babies, uh, so it's awesome. Like, if, if, if I was good at cloning, I would take that to, like, 20 of the Lockwoods and, and would love it, it had to have them involved in business because they're, like, killer workers. They care a lot. Is it ever weird? Like, Family it's, dynamics can get weird in business. They can. You know, they can. Um, and th- th- there are costs and benefits to everything. Right. I've personally never seen an incident where that's been an issue because they respect each other. And, you know, Kendall's the boss, man. <laughs> she is, everybody, know, everybody knows Kendall's the boss. So it's good. I, I like that idea of a, a reality show. We should, like, we should try to pitch that. So we I should got, create it. I guess I'm not familiar. When you, like, how involved is the family, her so, family at Ball and Biscuit? I'll give you my perspective. Yeah, go just ahead. as, like, as, as a patron, yeah. right? So um, 
So I go there. Obviously, Kendall was the first person I met. And then she's like, oh, that's my mom. I'm like, bullshit. That's not your mom. <laughs> she's like, no, seriously, that, that's my mom. Yeah. And then, um, gosh, what, what is her brother's name? Who's typically the bartender there's, when I was... Well, there's Cam. No. Keegan? Keegan. Yeah. yeah Keegan. So Keegan was my guy. Every time that we would go in there, yeah. like he met all of our friends. Like he was always our bartender. So I knew Keegan. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's my sister. I'm like, oh, bullshit. No, it's not. <laughs> it's like, no, seriously. So it's like Keegan, his mom, Kendall, all working in there. And then they start telling me that they have... I guess there are eight. There's a batch of eight of them, yep. right? And I'm like, I don't believe you. Like, name off all their names, right? <laughs> so you're starting to think of like Good Goodwill Hunting, right? That that scene in Goodwill Hunting where he's naming off all his brothers and sisters, and I mean, it was legit, just like that. Yeah, and they're all great, and they've all they've all helped out at the two places. So can't can't uh, <laughs> just happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that that's awesome! I just think that's such a neat little like fun fact uh, it is. about that bar. Yeah, yeah. And and talk about the name. And, and I, I think that maybe that falls short on some people. But if you ask them, like so everybody's willing to tell you on Ball and Biscuit or Babies yeah, or both. Ball, uh, both, I suppose. Yeah. yeah so Ball and Biscuit um, was originally the hub, right? So we had a pivot when we decided not to partner with Indie Hub in that way. Um, and my uh, GM and I were both like into music, and this place is going to be music centric, no TVs, which was kind of crazy at the time. <laughs> Um, and I was a White Stripes fan and the, the song Ball and Biscuit and so I started reading about uh, I read an article an interview rather with Jack White about that and it turned out that the Ball and Biscuit song was inspired by a Ball and Biscuit microphone and so there's a particular microphone from the 20s and 30s that looks like a apple I guess but it's called the Ball and Biscuit microphone and I thought well, it sounds kind of pubish, right? Ball and biscuit, and people aren't going to know, which I kind of like that. Uh, and it could give us something to play off of in terms of like ambiance, so you can just sprinkle some microphones around. Yeah, you've like got that that, that so. cool wall with with all of them. Yeah, there. and and still to this day, no TVs, right? No, no TVs. Yeah, no TVs. Did you trademark that name? Uh, in Indiana, I know, I, I know an IP attorney. In, just, uh, just yes, throwing, good, 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 good call. Out there. Good call. Yeah, good call. She told me I need to start doing a little bit more networking <laughs> on the podcast, like so you know, like a little that. more business development. Good, but, good. good. Uh, talk about babies. How yeah. did the name and so, yeah, actually I, the story in general? Concept, I think yeah. would be, yeah, it would be great. Yeah. So um, the so the building we're in now was once the drag show side of Talbot Street Nightclub. Um, and so it's got this great. And before that, it had a zillion different lives it opened as a grocery store but then it, it turned into a performance venue and everything from I'm, I'm told like hippie type uh, acoustic place to you know everything so it's got this really cool history um, it, we I wanted to be close by I live in Heron Morton neighborhood I want it to be close by um, and definitely wanted to be family friendly because that's my stage of life right now and uh, that fits the neighborhood um, and so but we wanted it to be at, like a place where adults could like enjoy too. So not over the top for kids, but just family friendly. The way I describe it is like if you're an adult watching a Disney movie and you know what that joke was, but you're the only one that knows what that joke was. We wanted it to be sort of like that. I like, love that. That's like, perfect for That was the this. concept. That was the concept. Like what's that sort of hidden joke in a Disney movie? That's what we want this place to be. And so we took all of those sort of disparate ideas and took them to Kodo who's been on here before good folks and um, they helped us with the name and the branding and stuff like that and babies resonated because everyone has a baby it could be you've got a kid or it could be you've got you know a significant other um, it's something that a drag show performer might say uh, so we wanted to have a nod to the history of the place at the same time be family friendly and family forward and so we just ran with it's simple has, happened to start with a B, which is goes with the ball and biscuit. And <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Beldons. Yeah, yeah the Beldons. Um, has there been any? Has there ever been any pushback? Just the the like uh, right the dichotomy of having like a mm. family friendly place and then like a drag show type place. Like I know you guys do a drag brunch and things like that, but like yeah. has that ever been like any backlash from people in the community? Not that I've heard. Um, quite honestly, Are we worried about it at all. You know. I'm kind of bullheaded about stuff, and if I think that it's not amoral, then, you know... I, like, you're a good I, litmus test for what people yeah, would accept. I think so. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to be, like, Kendall and myself, the other staff, I mean, we're, we wanted to be sort of progressive and open to every... Like, one of the other themes that we gave to Koto was, like, we wanted to be 
welcoming for everybody, man. We, and that's we wanted to have that message in every possible way. So I guess maybe into the question, if somebody's anti that, then eh, I don't really like. I'm not gonna really be wor- too worried about right. your opinion. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think has been the most rewarding thing so far? You guys are at a year? Oh, oh. no. So six months. Six. Oh, wow. Yeah. I so guess I didn't realize This will be your first, some, some first like, summer. Oh, wow. Yeah, first summer. That's going to be fun. It's going to be totally fun if, as long as people aren't in their houses. Yeah. <laughs> gosh. You just um, took that coronavirus full it, circle we'll, we'll there, man. Just, we'll let's not go there yet. Okay. Let's, yeah, we'll, right. we'll close out we'll, with we'll that. Let's try to be happy. We'll try to be happy right now. Um, yeah, so we're totally looking forward to the summer. I, I had forgotten because Ball and Biscuit was 10 years ago. I had forgotten about the trials and tribulations of starting a business, especially a restaurant business. Um, it's rough, man. It's stressful. There's tears sometimes. You're figuring stuff out. You don't want to disappoint any customer. You don't want to disappoint any staff member. And there's just so much to work through mm-hmm. when you start out. You do your best to prepare, but you can't. Just, you just can't prepare for everything. So... So we're getting at six months. We've been through you know a lot of the more heavy lifting on that, and so feeling better about it. Yeah. How involved are you as a leader in a lot of these projects? And I mean that in a sense of like, I, I see myself in you a yeah. lot in a sense yeah. of like I love creative ideas. I love yeah. building things. I love growing things. I love being involved with things. But I don't want to get stuck into my new show, the day to day operations mm-hmm. side. Like I want people to be creative in their own right and execute and yeah. you know get the systems and procedures in place yeah. but like are you the type of person where you're just like cc me on every email or are mm. you the type of person that's just like go make this happen when you f- if you fail ask me a question if you have questions ask me a question like what's your style yeah the latter for sure okay 100 percent the latter so there are there will be a handful of things where i feel like i have to be involved if there's like a, a if it's a big dollar amount maybe i'll be involved what's a big dollar amount like <sighs> man because like for me the, it's like if 20 the, bucks if the, if the hvac is down i want to be involved with that because that's like you know five figures or something you yeah. know so uh more so at that level um and and that's partially out of necessity because like my first i want to be so to be clear, professionally, my first priority, 100, percent is, is my clients and my. Oh yeah, I forgot company. you're a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, so that's my priority. So just out of necessity, I can't be. Um, and then secondly, and probably as importantly, I, I'm not an operator. Like I, I have to trust the people on the floor and who are seeing what's going on. So I trust them with the menu, trust them with the hiring, trust them with, you know, pretty much everything. Um, and that's knock on wood. It's it's been a good uh, relationship. You, you, br- you bring up a good point. Another question I wanted to ask was like, have you ever like has there been a day where shit hit the fan where like you're in your lawyer capacity, but then found out something bad happened at Ball and Biscuit or Babies, and you're just like, oh man, like I got to figure out what my priorities are right now. No, luckily it's never happened. Knock on wood. Yeah, it knock doesn't. On wood. Knock on wood. Yeah, no. That's never happened. Because I um, guess I just, I'm not having, you know, a lawyer as a wife. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know, maybe you're not unique, but I feel like you're unique in the sense of you do the, like, you have your day job, mm-hmm. you're a lawyer, that's yeah. your priority. But yeah, you have all these other projects you're a part of and yeah. all these other businesses you've started. Right. But I don't see a ton of other lawyers doing that. Yeah, it, it happens. I mean, we have a handful of folks in, in our firm, and maybe that's what's influenced me somewhat, to see them get involved with business. And again, they're not operators. They they help with the financing. They help with the business side of things, okay. which is what I do. Yeah. Um, but it's not for everybody, for sure. But the corollary is, like, there are some partners in my office who are heavily involved in coaching, like their kids, or athletics. Um, or, they, or they have, like, very dedicated maybe they're professors on the side they have very dedicated gotcha side hustles is the wrong word but like that um yeah but they just they're just maybe not in business um i don't have those you know i don't, I don't my my kids are three and five and i'm not doing it probably not going to be coaching them you know um i'll be attending but not not coaching and uh so i put some time in, into these places yep. yeah cool do you get bored easily no you know, honestly, if I didn't have this stuff going on and I could like sit and read a book, I'd be cool with that. I would really be cool with that. <laughs> would you watch Netflix or read a book? Yes, Netflix for sure. All of my written 
like media is consumed through my ears. So I do audio books and mm-hmm. podcasts in the car. Yeah. Why? Did you just, just were you over just it from for, law school? For efficiency. Or you just like, oh. No, just for efficiency. <laughs> like I can't. Are you at one and a half? Two 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 X guy? Um no, I'm I'm normal except for Thank God. there might be a, there might be one that I do one and a half. What was it that I did one and a half? I just wanted to hear it but get through yeah. it real quick. But yeah, that's what's it. The, I mean I, I mean what's the point yeah, at that I point? I know. I know. all you crazy and I'm looking at you, Jared, like <laughs> one and a half, like two X speed people, you're crazy. One and a half. What, what is the for point? Sure. What is the point, dude? I listen to you on two just because <laughs> yeah, I don't. You want, shouldn't. You shouldn't be listening to me at all. Just because I don't want to listen. Uh, that's so, funny. Uh, I want to ask you this one question. Uh, just a little fun fact that I found on the internet and, and LinkedIn. Um, but and, and then we'll talk about some of these drinks from Upland. But I'm told that you you hold a patent and a I trademark. Do. Yeah. What, what what is it for? Well, it's a patent. So. Um, Those are two different things, by the way. Oh, David. I put Just a slash from, in my I, notes. From, a, from an intellectual yes. property then professional. Someone needs to tell the website that I Googled it on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I used to wear contact lenses, and my contact lenses had like these etchings at the bottom that said one, two, three. And if they were inside out, they would say backwards, like three, two, one. Like, like you could see it in your eyeball? Nope. So you could look in the. Oh, gotcha. You could hold it up mm-hmm. and see it. And that way you knew you should turn it this way or this way and put it in your eye. But. When you're hard of sight, finding the one, two, three was like a real challenge. But luckily, one of my contacts had a little tear at the bottom next to the one, two, three. So I would pick it up and ease, I could easily it's find it. It's very dangerous. Well, but it, <laughs> this was really small and it didn't affect my eye. But it was a great way of spotting the one, two, three. Yeah. So it was the combination of the one, two, three and this little notch at the bottom was my far, by far my favorite contact lens. And so I went to one of our patent folks and I said, hey, it, if we did this, these things together like that, is that sort of patentable subject matter? And he said, sure. So I followed the patent. And it's been sitting there. Hasn't done anything. Hasn't. Oh, so this yeah. isn't making you money? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> No, I had this grand plan of like going and pitching it to Shark Bao Shalom or whomever, you know, hey, you've really got to do this. And yeah. I just, no, haven't gotten around to it. What's, so That's pretty funny. When, when I was a kid, um, maybe I wasn't a kid. I don't know. I was in middle school or something. But you had like, and then I think everybody goes to these classes where like you invent a product, right? And like, mm. that's your assignment. And I thought I had this genius idea of... It, and maybe the, I'm confusing two different ideas that I had. But one was like... Uh, a, you know those self-tinting glasses when you hit the sun or whatever, right? Uh, transitional lenses, like a windshield for your car that does that, right? I see it. Super smart. I see it. And then the other one was like the same thing. I don't know why I was so obsessed with windshields, but <laughs> <laughs> it was one that would like turn yellow at night because I had bad night vision, yeah. right? Because you sure. know those motorcycle people wear yellow tinted glasses when it's later at night. So I'm staring at your questions right now. And don't I really, stare at my questions. I really like this question, but like... I might flip it a little bit. Would you recommend people investing in a bar or a restaurant or communal space, such as something like Ball and Biscuit or Babies? Like, I mean, yeah, I, you you'd mentioned how going through that process and now being where you're like starting all over again, essentially with babies. You're yeah. like, oh yeah, I forgot. Like, right. this is actually hard. Right. Um, can you talk about? I mean, not that there's essentially any you know extreme failures, but there c- could oh, be. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, can you talk about some of that? Yeah. So here's the perfect. Pro- Profile for someone who should think about that uh, investing in a bar is, is someone who can first of all afford to lose all their money. <laughs> so, like number one is you can lose this, and you'll be fine. Number one, and you have to be fine with it. Not only can you take it, but you have to be totally cool with yeah. it. So that's number one. So you're gambling, kind of. Yeah, k- kind of because that gets calculated to, risk. That gets to point number two, which is <laughs> you have to be like interested in owning a bar. Like that has to provide you some benefit of. Like, I just want to say that I own a piece of that place. Um, I find that that's a big motivation for folks uh, to invest when they know that the risk-adjusted return on most places, you'd be better off doing something else probably. Um, So there's this sentimental part or this emotional part about owning a piece of a bar or restaurant or could be like, hey, I want to help that particular area of the community. Um, If you have that type of return like the emotional return plus a possible return on your money then that's sort of the right profile for someone who could 
entertain investing in a, in a bar or restaurant, I think. With that in mind, what is your specific, you, like your long-term plan on, on yeah. both Ball and Biscuit and Babies? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's to just keep them, I hope they, I hope they become, you know, stalwarts, you know, hope they around for as long as they can be. So I don't have any intention, didn't get into it to sort of sell them or anything like that. Um, uh, my investors, I don't have any right to sort of buy out my investors and they don't have the right to sort of be bought out. It's sort of a long-term thing um, because like I said, a lot of people are motivated to sort of keep it and say that they're part of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the, that's the plan, just to keep them going. Gotcha. What, what did I miss? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down, invest in bars? Is if you're if, if if you're a certain type of person with yeah, yeah. okay One, wonderful this is yeah. what I love about this podcast a lot of times people don't know Fabian just gets up and leaves <laughs> because he's got a bladder of like a three year old I'm also on like a hundred ounce of water program I'm on a new water program <laughs> is that hashtag anyway anyway we've been sipping on some of their uh, some of their beers and I want to take a little sip out of each again so that I can like just a really quick sip uh, but we've had three of their of their oak variety sours and I'll tell you a little bit more about them here in a second so uh, we've had the oak and white which I'm going to try that one so it's barrel aged fruited sour ale oak and white um, so these have been aged in Oliver Winery barrels um, so this one uh, is a blend of their base sour blonde ale aged on Vidal Blanc grapes from Oliver uh, Oliver's Creek Bend uh, Vineyard so uh, yeah this is like a white wine barrel aged sour I wrote down light tart sour and cheeks so whatever you think cheeks means that's this one um uh, I, I would say of the three, not my favorite. It's the lightest. You say uh, not your favorite? Not my favorite. Uh, the oak and rosé, or oh, yeah, oak and rosé. Again, another one of these barrel-aged fruited sours. Uh, using another different barrel from from Oliver Winery. This is on. I'm, I'm going to butcher it. Chambrushen, Chambrushen grapes from Oliver's uh, Creek Bend Vineyard. So this one. My notes not as tart, a little heavier, smooth as silk. What do you think? I'm trying it again, um, but I did rate this one as my favorite, and I wrote next to it breakfast. Yeah. So, oh man, yeah, I could see that. What would you pair it with? Give me one second. Like, I would almost say like a like a waffle or something. You know, something like a little heavy because it's so light. Yeah. Uh, and then this one was my absolute favorite, the oak and red. This is just like what I want in a sour beer is this oak and red. Interesting. I uh, I would I would disagree. I would say the second one, oak and rosé, was my favorite. Oak and white was my second favorite. And oak and red was actually my least favorite of the three. Really? Um, I just feel, I, I don't know, the oak and red to me just had some like funkiness to it, which yeah. I'm just not my, 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 my jam right this moment. Uh, can be at other times, but... And are you typically like a red or a white wine guy? I'm typically... Depends on a mo- yeah. mood. Okay. Typically white, I guess. Okay. Maybe, right at dinner. Yeah. So maybe it's a good dinner drink. Yeah. Do you uh, do you get down on sour beers? Trevor? I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. For sure. Um, are, you, are you digging one of these more, th- more I, than the other? I'm with Jared on the rosé. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Uh, okay, so let's finish this out, and then we'll, we'll talk about that and get into some rapid fire. Can I just that- say, uh, on Upland, so my wife has never experienced... Uh, Parks and Rec, so we're into like season two now, and every once in a while, there's a phenomenal like product shot of Upland in that show, and I'm like, that is so brilliant, so brilliant. Yeah, I don't, I mean, that's probably work from Young and Laramore, maybe I would assume. I don't know if that's the brewery that has the cachet to like be like, here you go, put this on your show. I well, would assume it's maybe Young and Laramore. I, you know, I'm sure they want it to be Indiana authentic, yeah. and so they. But the, and there was recently another show as well with like Ted Danson maybe I think The Good Place had it oh. and it could have been a fake like a deep fake from the internet but <laughs> I'm almost positive it's real so anyway uh, Upland is our, our, our beverage sponsor this month this is part of their Oak series um, looks like the consensus winner is that Rosé which oh, again yes. was really really good but uh, I, I was more of a fan of the if, red but none of them were, were bad if like, we went back to our old school episode number one rating oh, I would say go buy the oak and rosé and drink that for breakfast 
<laughs> on on a weekend for brunch, guys, not just yeah. like everyday breakfast. I would, but. yeah, I would age the other two. Remember, aging was one oh, of them. Yeah, like age it that. that's, or, that's or shelf it or something like we're, that. We're, yeah. we're dating ourselves. We're right in the weeds. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now we're gonna play our favorite game called Rapid Fire. Sure. Um, Am I allowed to drink this, by the way? Yes. Yeah, so talk. Well, talk a little bit about it. So that's. I mean. So I guess my first question before we get into rapid fire, you guys are known for doing a couple of unique things here: yeah. roasted chicken, which you don't see everywhere, and then these boozy milkshakes. Yeah. Um, and you know, you come in here, there's a diner vibe right. to it with these hot pink, like I don't even know what you would call that material. Uh, vinyl, I think it's vinyl. Vinyl, yeah. vinyl um, booth seats. So talk yeah. a little bit about the menu before we we, we dive into yeah, this. Do one. you know is this alcoholic or non-alcoholic? I don't know which one she brought first. Okay. I the creamsicle is the one that she said is going to be the non-alcoholic. Not correct. And one of them is peanut butter, and that doesn't. I think yeah. that's the banana split, Jared. We'll, have, we'll get the we'll get confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just. I, I have a sweet tooth, so I'm just like, yeah. give me the milkshake. So the we were talking about like the the uh, the idea of having oh. the, the the joke that only adults get in Disney films. That's like a boozy milkshake, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody else just looks like a milkshake. But yeah. The adult knows that there's alcohol in there yeah. so so that was that was something that we wanted to do uh, bringing like we wanted to incorporate ball and biscuit a little bit into the spot and so the draft cocktails and the boozy milkshakes um, and then you know on the food side uh, being from Michigan roasted chicken is a thing um, Michigan Wisconsin thing and and uh, which one is which let's see it's a straw Okay, cool. Got it. What's this one? That's the... Creamsicle. The one without the alcohol and the orange juice. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, So, yeah, so we we broast the chicken, which is a pressure-fried technique. It's really good. Uh, And we also broast our tenderloin, which is also very good. And then the burgers are smash style, which is a classic sort of Indianapolis style of doing burgers and have these have the milkshakes been pretty popular yeah for sure like more popular than i thought like really? when i get the sales report and i see the percentage of sales that go to milkshakes it's it's more than i would have guessed what is a uh, like a brainstorm session like that look like you know what i mean like so you're like oh yeah cool let's do milkshakes and you're like i don't really think it's gonna work and all of a sudden it's like oh this has worked <laughs> way better than i expected like there's a, i mean there's a lot of that. So some of, I mean, milkshakes were kind of an obvious ch- choice for us. There really wasn't too much debate about that one. But some stuff, like I'll tell you, like we, when we first opened, we were making our own ketchup, and we thought that would be a great idea. Set us, it'll set us apart. Which one was yours? Uh, this, this guy. Got it. Can we cheers these? Yeah, cheers. cheers. Oh my gosh. Cheers, cheers. These hey, are like perfect looking milkshakes. This yeah, is ridiculous. Still it's gonna be good. Um. So anyway, it was a bad idea. Uh, turns out Heinz has perfected ketchup. <laughs> so why try to like top that? And it was a lot of labor that went into making the ketchup and like the durability. Like it turns out if you like have your own ketchup, it doesn't have preservatives, can't be outside for very long, yeah. you know? So we, we had a lot of lessons learned like that. Uh, it's funny. There's a, another local business. Yeah who's not here anymore that did that as well and one of my biggest feedbacks was always like just do normal ketchup <laughs> like, like you said like yeah. nothing wrong with red gold <laughs> yeah or, or red gold yeah so and I, I don't know honestly between the two which ones we use but sometimes if it's not broke yeah i'm trying to fix it yeah so what do you think holy cow <laughs> this is Insane. I haven't had... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm like smiling. I can't even talk right you now. Have I haven't some on, had a you have it on your sweatshirt. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like, for those who are listening right now, Fabian literally is licking a sweatshirt um, and spilt it off. I haven't had a milkshake in I don't know how long. And mm. this is like taking me back to my childhood. Mm-hmm. Can yeah. you guys ask me the last time I had a milkshake? When did you have the last? Milkshake. Saturday. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a sweet tooth. In fact, I went to the new place called Milkshakes on Mass oh. Ave. How was it? Um, solid. Nice. I mean... You can order whatever you want, ice cream, dairy, non-dairy related in there. Yep. So I don't know if you're familiar, but they took the space of the Natural Born Juicers. Oh, mm-hmm. sure. On Mass Ave, so close by Love Handle over there towards the end of Mass Ave. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, so it's, it's, awesome. it's another small business that, you know, yeah. hopefully makes it up yeah. in that area. Cause For sure. Hudson's going to kill me, dude. Oh, yeah. You're on a nutrition thing right now. You're smashing a dreamsicle so I, I'm probably only going to have three ounces of that. Okay. Well, That's I'll, probably I'll, all I can afford today. I'll drink the rest of it. Um, awesome. Okay, so ra- rapid fire. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't want you to describe it because I want people to come experience it experience it for yourself so we're going to number them one two and three in like the order that they are walking that way okay. which one is your favorite wallpaper in the bathroom oh uh probably two i like two as well so yeah. i always use the middle one yeah. mm-hmm. um what keeps you up at night uh, right now uh i want to keep this light i won't bring up corona again but uh <laughs> that that right now yeah for sure it keeps me up at night yeah we'll tie that in later yeah. on <laughs> <laughs> all right you mentioned the white stripes earlier mm-hmm. um if they're not your favorite musician like who would you say like wh- what's the music you listen to 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 get you going you know i listen to honestly all varieties right now i've been i'm literally on the last episode of the ken burns country music uh documentary and it's amazing and so literally i'm li- listening to like chris christopherson right now just because of that and i'm not even a country person really country western person but uh yeah so pretty much everything he was in a band jared called <laughs> come on jared you know this i don't know this come on dude i was about to give you a thousand dollars come on for a thousand dollars i watch i'm gonna get it wrong but it's the highway man yes yeah and there's a beer in town called Come on, dude! Double the money, two thousand bucks. Uh, don't know Cannonball. His name's Chris Christopherson. What's the name of the beer? I don't know. It's Christopherson, <laughs> and Big Lug makes it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I'm. That's good trivia. I'm just being mean. Sorry. That's good trivia. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm like literally dyslexic when it comes to music. <laughs> if that's even a thing. That's sure. Right. Sure. Um. Well, I was gonna ask, what are you currently obsessed with? But I'm afraid I know your answer. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, Ken Burns, country music. <laughs> I, I thought maybe you were going to say coronavirus. coronavirus as well. So, <laughs> very bad question. It's, it's, it, I mean, every current event is like affected right now. Yeah. Um, gets you a weird headspace. A, a book or movie that, that's inspired you? Mm, inspired. Oh, man. And maybe inspired is too strong of a word, but what's a book or movie that's like really stuck with you? So I just finished a book, and, I'm, and by finished a book, I mean the somebody uh, read it to the, you. The audio, yes. Somebody, <laughs> somebody just just finished it, and it's Scott Galloway, and it's called The Algebra of Happiness. Interesting. And totally recommend it. It's definitely unapologetically focused on dudes, so it's a little bit please bro focused, but very real, I think too. <clears throat> Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's a recommendation, I think. What do you mean, bro? Focus. So he's, you know, he's a guy, and he comes from his perspective, and he's talking to guys. Really, I mean, I think there are lessons for everybody, but uh, he's he's not trying to be. He's trying to talk to a specific mm-hmm. audience. Got it. Yeah. Like, okay. so he's talking about fatherhood, and he's not even attempting to talk about parenthood. He's talking about fatherhood and stuff like that. So. And I mean, do you think? I don't think. Man, this is difficult, right? Like that could be seen as divisive, of just like uh, separating into sexes, or, or anytime you separate anything, it, by nature is divisive, right? But like I think we're at a point where we've gone too far in, in certain aspects. So like for me, something like that is almost like comforting to know that there's still people talking to specific audiences without fear of like being called out for it. And maybe I'll get called out for that, but does, I mean, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, so I think that his book is basically, there, there's some empirical data, and he's, he talks about research on certain things, but a lot of it is just experiential, and he, that's all he knows, right? right? That's all he can talk about. So I think that's, to me, that makes sense. It's not, shouldn't be offensive. Um, yeah. If you had your own podcast and you were going to ask a guest a rapid fire question, <laughs> what would that question be? Oh, man. You like that, huh? Not Fisher? obvious at all. Uh, <laughs> likes that. I would say, uh, oh my God. what commercial inspires you? <laughs> Ooh, 
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, if we, there was that. Yeah, we, that's, he's not asking us. That's his question. Oh. So now we have to take this and ask future guests. Okay. There you go. Good. All right, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Yeah, of course, from, of course from the you Super will. Bowl. I can't of help myself. This is Fabian's the, rapid fire. Yeah, from the Super Bowl, do you remember the one? If you guys watched the commercials, there was the one with all like the people doing the crazy rocket mortgage legs, or whatever. maybe it was yes, a rocket I, mortgage, but it was somebody. Yeah, and it was like them doing this crazy dance. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man! It's, it's I would so uh, since we're going on this topic. Thanks, Trevor, for bringing us <laughs> up. Um, I think you know the Old Spice. Like I think they created this genre of commercials in their own right a couple of years back when they created the crazy. Wild oh, just ones. like weird, sure. yeah, the weird yeah. ones, and now there's weird commercials, Geico, like Skittles. Like, I feel like they created a brand new genre For of sure. commercials because of that. Liberty yeah. Mutual, um, they reached an audience, and yeah. now everybody's following. It. Dude, yeah. great sure. question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this to future <laughs> guests. There you go. Uh, so, I'll ask uh, two more, okay. two more. Uh, favorite romantic comedy. Mm. <laughs> movie or, or sh- yeah, movie. movie? Um, I would say. It's, it's been a minute since I've seen a romantic comedy. I'm going to say... Hmm, Sleepless in Seattle? Question mark? Great freaking movie. <laughs> Is Serendipity with John Cusack? Is that the name of the movie? Or I don't no? know if he's in that, but Serendipity does sound like a movie. Okay. I think that's... <laughs> If it's not, it should be. <laughs> yeah, see, what a great movie. Oh, no, you know what? I just got that movie confused with You've Got Mail. Mm, same, very, very similar, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, there's a bookstore involved. No, that's You've Got Mail. Yeah. Damn it. Who would you recommend as a future guest? <laughs> so uh, I mentioned Blake Johnson already. He's such, such, a, such a good person um, and knows so much about the city. I think it'd be awesome. I, Isn't he running for something? He is. So he's running for a congressional seat in our Indiana legislature. Um, and so he can talk about politics, uh, talk about being in politics as, at a very young age. Uh, so, and just a good all around person. Um, I'm, I've been interested, or I would be interested to hear from someone who's a professional ath- athlete living in Indianapolis or has been. Um, so, we would too. One, one person like. Tamika Catchings. Uh, so she has, um, she's in this neighborhood with a business right over here called Tease Me. Mm-hmm. She's a wonderful person. Like, talk about, like, how do you find time? She's an entrepreneur over there. She's got a bunch of charitable stuff going. But, like, she's the point person for organizing community stuff here, which is kind of insane. Uh, and and um, so I, she would be a great guest, I feel like. She would be awesome. Uh, All right. Yeah. Someone who's, who's been suggested before, so maybe yeah. the powers that be will will all make that happen. <laughs> someone connect us. Yeah, someone listening at this point. Um, this has been awesome. Good. Thank you for for allowing us here to, to record, giving us milkshakes, and, and giving us the opportunity to, to help you tell your story. Um, is there anything that that we missed out on? Anything you want to shout out? Events that you guys have coming up? Where can people find you? Where, like, where can they look at pictures of this place? Yeah, all of the above. So all the social media is uh, Babies Indie and B and B Indie B A B B N B. Oh, so babies, yes, B A B underscore indie. Uh, but if you just search it, you'll probably find it. And then uh, B N B indie is Ball and Biscuit. Those are great ones um, for social media, especially Instagram. Um, nothing comes to mind other than, like, especially in these times, just be conscientious about, like, thinking about local restaurants and local shops and stuff because they definitely need the support. Even if it's like takeout, right? If that makes you feel better, I, I encourage that kind of thing, not just at our places, but all the places. So, yeah. Agreed. Awesome. Well, well, thank you again, Trevor. This, is, this has been awesome. Um, as we like to say, drink culture. No your city. Your city. <laughs> Beat you. We're, we're out. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening. If you've made it this far, please don't shut it off just yet. We have one quick ask of you. If you enjoy these episodes that we put out for you on a weekly basis, please consider rating us, 
writing us a review, subscribing to our show and sharing this with friends. Uh, the best thing that we can ever get from you guys is just feedback and, and letting us know that you enjoy it. And the best way to do that is just to share our, our podcast. So if you haven't taken the time to leave a review or just rate us on iTunes, that would go a long way. So if you can, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see you guys share, repost and subscribe. Thanks guys.